what we all learned from that was when we're looking for things and we're make, trying to make it happen, it can happen. And so what happened was we had students attached to organizations and we found opportunities for them that aligned with their skill level and ability. And they could see themselves reflected in the workplace. They could come back to the school and tell their stories of co-op education as well as other students and experiential learning. And their families were so delighted because they obviously were able to apply their skills. They had workplace opportunities when they left. And that's we're tracking. Those are individual stories that we're tracking one by one. And we're hoping to improve upon it. I am well, I am engaged, and I am prepared. Those are the three tenets of the Avon Maitland strategic plan. I was so impressed when I saw that just because of the simplicity of them and the way in which those can be implemented and shared and and fostered by every person in the district. So that's what attracted me, first of all, to checking out the Avon Maitland's website and the leadership of Dr. Lisa Walsh. Lisa and I were able to sit down and talk through some of that work that they're doing in the district through their use of data and also storytelling. And so i um, really grateful to be able to talk with Lisa. A couple things of note, Lisa let me know prior to our call that she was about to, she hadn't already when we recorded, but she was about to announce her retirement from her time at Avon Maitland and uh, so we talked a little bit about that offline a little bit in the a little bit in the actual recording as well and secondly you don't want to miss the very end of of the podcast if you don't know this already if you're one of these people who just like listens to little snippets and then quits I mean you do you um, I always ask people at the end to talk a little bit about their community and, and tell us about some hidden gems in terms of places that visitors to their area might want to explore. And Lisa takes the cake for really pumping up that part of Ontario. It's not a part I'm particularly familiar with, the Stratford area, but after listening to her, it's like, yeah, that's, that's a place I need to check out. So many good things she shares. So that's just a little bonus for you. This episode is brought to you by Advanced Learning Partnership. Uh, we are serving communities all across North America, really diving into the generative AI space. Got some great experts on board and some great leadership in that area, but as well, continuing to foster things like uh, workplace wellness, esports, leadership, development, strategic, you name it, we do it. And uh, we're really proud of the work we do. So with that, enjoy my episode with Dr. Lisa Walsh. Lisa, uh, I was really looking forward to our conversation today and, uh, We've had a couple of chances to talk and every time I thought, I thought oh, I should press record and capture what we talk, but we're <laughs> going to capture it now. One of the things I think that, um, that interested me when I looked at the Avon Maitland website is, uh, is your strategic strategic plan. And, and listen, I work with school districts across North America and strategic plans are eh, a little bit of dime a dozen. Like they, they sometimes, they sometimes have a very corporate, formal feel to them. There's a bit of, there's quite a bit of, you know, uh, generic language that's used. And so that it, they, for most times, they don't really excite people. Yours was a little different though. They're not just, I don't think posters on the wall, but they are things that I think I, you feel like have had an impact actually on uh, students and teachers, parents, everybody in the organization. Maybe talk a little bit about where that came from and kind of what the three big ideas are around your strategic plan. Sure. Thanks, Dean. And it's great to join you as well. Um, our strategic plan used to have six pillars and, and then two categories on top of that. And when I first started in this role, I asked people, tell me about the str strategic plan and how you see your work connected to it. And people looked at me with this stunned, like deer in the headlights, like, oh my gosh, she's asking me about the strategic plan. And I know that plans can often just be for planners. And I wanted something that people could say, this is what we're about in this district. And it's not different from our strategic plan. It is our strategic plan. We live it every day and it's important to us. And so um, when we went, when we did the next rendition of the strategic plan, we talked about that with a lot. We gathered input from students, from community members, and obviously from staff, all groups of stakeholder staff. And we asked them, well, how do you see yourself in this work? And they talked about the doing. They talked about how they felt coming to work. And they talked about 
feeling excited about what what made made this place tick and what made people want to be here. And we arrived through a a process of um, making it really, you know, we we get kind of big and then we'd come back to, yeah, but what does that mean? And we conceptualized our strategic strategic plan into three key ideas. I am prepared, I am well, I am engaged. And the AM, um, we put it in capital letters because it is our board, Avon Maitland. And um, we wanted it to signify both both staff and students and their journeys in our district. And so um, those concepts are, uh, well, what happened after that is when we developed this four-year plan around those three um, core priority areas, we started talking about and to what end. So when a student enters our district um, for a 14-year journey, so we also developed something called the image of the successful graduate. And that image of the successful graduate is where we're leading to in our I am prepared, I am well, I am engaged um, work. And that is, we have two pieces to that, prepared for their next step and prepared for a changing world. And this is really based on the skills that we're looking for for students. So we want them to be literate and numerate. Um, We want them to be able to um, advocate for their own learning. We want them to be global citizens. We want them to be curious thinkers and resilient and flexible thinkers who, um, you know, who feel like learning is not happening to them, but they're part of the learning agenda. And so that further shaped our pillars of our strategic plan. And um, and then we've outlined a year by year plan of goals to to uh, achieve that four year plan. So let's talk about both. Uh, data that you might be collecting around that one, but also want to talk about stories that you might have that support that. So let's first talk about sort of the raw data. Like what, what, again, you can choose one or three or however many you want to, but what data data? would you be able to share that says uh, that, that shows sort of progress in any one of these areas? So the, um, I am prepared area, for example, is really about literacy and numeracy. It's about building future skills, social, emotional, global, digital. And it's also about multiple pathways. So the interesting thing is that there's a lot of data that we just get from our provincial government. So we have EQAO data. We have these big standardized tests. We have grad rate data, credit accumulation, et cetera. We have used for the last two years, we we were actually talking about monitoring and measuring um, our, our three areas, the work that we're doing. So, of course, there's strategies. How are we going to improve on the preparedness um, agenda for students in our district and for staff? And then what we do is we talk about, okay, so monitoring is we held a workshop. We, um, we bought this book for everybody and we did a book study. It's the, it's the kind of checklist things. We're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. But actually, at the end of the day, what impact does it make on students and their lives? And that's what we call measuring. So then we have this big provincial data, which we get every year, that comes back to us and, um, you know, it, it, it's connected to student um, achievement at a provincial level, like the standardized test, for example. But we designed, um, we started talking about, well, that's just, that, that data is good for trend setting over time, but it's not good for, so what happened, it's lagging data, it's already passed the year when we get that data. And so what we decided to do was investigate how can we have a more um, streamlined approach to and consistent approach across our district. So we're using a book by Shane Safir. It's called Street Data. And it talks about three levels of data, satellite data, which is the type of data I've been talking about. But map data is here's a report card data of my class. You know, everybody's got a B. How come nobody has an A? How come some people have a C? How come we have so many students that we we couldn't get an, a mark for? That sort of thing. And then the story data comes in that street level data. And we're doing a lot of equity work in this district, which we're really excited about because it is working with students in the margins. You know, who are these students who kind of are maybe not the focus of the attention all the time if we plan for, for um, them in particular? We're going to strengthen the all. And so we're looking at what, what's their story. Do they see themselves reflected in the curriculum? 
Is this curriculum accessible? Is the way we're teaching it accessible to them? Are they engaged and excited about um, coming to school because of what they're learning? And taking stock of how they're doing along the way. So I would say that, you know, the approach is multi level. So we call it the triangulation of data. We're looking at different types of data. And then we have our particular students that we're focusing in on and and asking ourselves, how are they doing? What's their story? And if they're doing well, you know, then we can really feel proud that most of our students are doing well. And and we're catching kids that might have fallen through the gaps in previous renditions of our plan. Do you have a, a specific story you could tell about teacher or a student or a school that that you are proud of in some way shape or form in terms of exemplifying the 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 plan we do have we do have um some of our special ed or identified students who have struggled in regular classroom um, pedagogy and practices and they do sometimes have the support of an ea and i know that um last year we had some students that we were you know, the superintendent was telling us the story about students that saw themselves reflected in their local communities because they are also doing co-op programming. So there's a special team in our board that is looking for other ways to ensure that their skills can also be applied in a work in a work setting. And I think what we all learned from that was when we're looking for things and we're make, trying to make it happen, it can happen. And so what happened was we had students attached to organizations and we found opportunities for them that aligned with their skill level and ability. And they could see themselves reflected in the workplace. They could come back to the school and tell their stories of co-op education as well as other students and experiential learning. And their families were so delighted because they obviously were able to apply their skills. They had workplace opportunities when they left. And that's, we're tracking, those are individual stories that we're tracking one by one and we're hoping to improve upon in our district. Oh, that's, that's awesome, Lisa. And I think, you know, the the stories that often in, in education that are amplified often, often come when parents can articulate that, that joy and that success in that, right? Because oftentimes students, they don't give you, they don't give you everything you want, right? They're they're Sometimes they can, they just don't uh, have a way to express it or choose not to. But when mom and dad or whomever says, Hey, thank you. This is, this is making a difference in my child's life. Somehow that's a, that's a big, that's a big plus for you as a, you know, whether you're the teacher involved with that or the leader or just, again, you know, we, we can't do this work without, without the support of our parents in that community. So I think that's a, that's a really, really important, um, indicator. We, you know, another thing that we're doing is our climate survey is one of those other indicators. And this is, um, you know, it's a survey that we do every second year with students, but we also do it with our staff and our parents. And then we can compare the results. And um, we're asking parents this year, we were about to launch our parent and community um, survey to find out, you know, what's their experience about coming to our schools, the the parents' experience. Do they feel welcome? Do they feel a sense of belonging? Do they have a good uh, communication path with their child's teacher, with the administrator and other adults in the building? Do they feel like their child is cared about in that school? And then what is their child's experience? So as reflected to them from their child, what has their child told them about the school setting? And that's really important to us because if we don't have good relationships with our families and they don't see themselves as part of the package of what we offer here and, you know, how we do this work together, then we're, we're going to be half as successful as we actually could be. Absolutely. Um, so Lisa, when this launches, uh, you will have you will have made a pretty big, significant uh, announcement about the your career, and um, and sadly for probably the folks in Avon Maitland, but not sadly for you and and others you're going to serve is that you're you're stepping down as director of education in the district uh, to pursue some other things that you that you're passionate about, but. So first of all, congratulations on that. But but second of all, I just wanted to ask, when you kind of look at, and, and you, you haven't written your going away speech yet, so this will help you in, in <laughs> your going away, <laughs> reflecting, right, on all of the all of the things you've learned. And, you know, we talk about 
the organizational framework and strategic uh, planning and stuff. And again, I just wonder if you, you know, when you look back at the lessons you've learned in leadership along the way, um, you know, are there some lessons that stood out either positively or negatively that you think have helped shape the way you, uh, you know, sort of led into these, these last few years in the district? Hmm. It's a great question. Yes, I, I've had a, a number of different leadership roles in my life, and every one of them has taught me something about how I work with people, um, how people, you know, how how people really at the at the core of it, everybody wants to feel like they matter in in the picture of the work that's being done, and you know, authenticity. And just being yourself goes a long way in connecting with people and listening, listening, listening. I did my executive coach um, course a few years ago, or just recently, actually. And I wish I had done it much sooner. It, it emphasized everything that I know about good leadership, which is, you know, listen most of the time and think about what people are saying before you synthesize and talk and set direction. So I think that has bode well in my career is to listen to my senior team, to the principals that we work with. I visit schools primarily to have a have a observation as well into classrooms and he, listen to teachers and EAs and custodians about what they love about their jobs, what they find challenging about the work, and to talk to kids about what's engaging them in their classroom practices. So right. I think uh, connecting with people is number one in this job. And then, you know, constantly, we used to use this old analogy of standing on the balcony or standing on the dance floor. And I think that this is a, being a leader is a dance between doing both. You know, there's those times that you reflect and stand on that balcony right. and look over the organization and say, hmm, what's really working well? And what do we want to keep doing? And oh, what's not working so well? And also being super engaged in the work, not just having a high level picture of it. So I'd say, you know, in terms of the equity work we're doing, like learning alongside the team, because how can you help to make uh, good policies and procedures around things that you don't really have a firm understanding about? So I would consider myself a learner, first and foremost, in the practices that are happening as well. Well, and I know that you've taken that disposition to your leadership because you told me um, in our conversation earlier that you that you kind of had a bit of a I don't want to say shake up, but in your senior leadership team's portfolio, so they don't do the same thing. So the person who was in charge of, and I don't even I won't try to guess what those portfolios were, but you've changed them, and and I think you know some people might find that well that why would you do that? I mean, you just got going on something. So talk a little bit about what you did with that. And why you did that? Yeah, I, I do think that leadership is a journey of continuous learning. And as soon as you start to get really comfortable and think that, you know, oh, this is how we do it. We always do it this way. And I do hear that sometimes. Then then I no longer think you're at the top of your game because you're no longer observing, reflecting and listening to people. You're doing things in a kind of um, habitual way that might no longer be the best way because change is inevitable and the world is changing constantly. So, um, you know, it's bumpy to move people around. I have to say it's not something I do very often, but I do believe that as leaders, we have to be vulnerable. Being vulnerable is a good thing. It actually grounds you and it makes you remember that this is what people, other people experience when they're coming into our plans all the time and, you know, and they don't know exactly how we do things. So there's that aspect of it. And then the other thing is bringing the skill set you have to the new work and also learning from that team. It, it enables and mobilizes that team and energizes them. And it empowers them to be able to share that, that work with you. And then you, of course, bring your new lens to looking at right. that work to say, is this the very best way we can do it? So I think as leaders, we have to keep, we have to be adaptable to change. We have to be able to change ourselves if we're expecting other people to change. And so um, trans transition times are challenging. You know, I moved a lot of people around in locations in the, in the, school board this year. Some people had been situated in their spaces for 25 years. 
And that was not a comfortable thing to do. But now that people are actually moving into new places and adapting to it, there I'm hearing a lot of good things. And also with my senior team, I've moved their portfolios around and that that practice of you know, observing, sitting back a little bit and thinking through what you're observing to be happening and look for better ways of doing it is is starting to happen. And that's really exciting. Well, I think about a couple of thoughts came to my mind. Number one, uh, as an elementary teacher, you're teaching so many things like you gave up you gave up the the right to feel like an expert in all whatever eight disciplines that I would teach very quickly. So listen, I wasn't mm-hmm. a health expert. So, okay, but I'm teaching health now and I'm teaching, you know, so that there's some empathy, I think that, that can be transferred back to many of our educators who, you know, and in some cases they studied something very specific at university, but they're not teaching in that area anymore. And they had to figure that out. So I think there's, there's empathy around that one. And I think the other thing too, that crossed my mind is, Those leadership roles are not like there's a very there's a specific difference between being an expert and being a coach. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're all coaching roles, but there's an element of that. And coaching isn't as you probably know through your executive coaching training. It's not about like I know everything like they don't look to you as an expert. They look to you as a leader. And, you know, in any you can make the analogy in lots of sports that, you know, coaches aren't necessarily the top. The, the top uh, athlete, if you will, or, but they, they serve a different role. And so I, I don't, I think it's, it's, you know, and I, I'm grateful for the opportunities that I had to be put in uncomfortable pos- positions. I remember, and this is going back my district time for, for like, it was like, felt like a cup of coffee. It was probably a year. I was, I was leading the indigenous learning in our district. Now I am not the person for that. I don't have the expertise and I was, ve- but there was nobody to do it at the time. And I was like the best choice they had. Now, what I remember about that year is all the learning that I had and how much that helped me understand just about that culture and that experience that I was completely ignorant. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know that I w- was meant to ever stay in that role long term, but I'm just grateful for the chance that I got to be exposed to something that I wouldn't have chosen that. But boy, is that a nice thing to have uh, have had that experience. And, and I think it has served me in other leadership capacities as well. Well, and you know, one thing I'd add is is that is something um, about the virtual reality world that is a really nice thing. When you give people experiences, they seem to remember them better than if they didn't do it themselves. You know, like mm-hmm. people have to embrace that. And when you put put people into a little bit of a, a place where they have to embrace that new learning because they have to do it to be successful, they actually learn a lot more. They learn a lot faster. Look at COVID. I think COVID was a perfect example. We thought it would take years to get people trained on how to. We actually built a tech continuum. This is an interesting story. And we were going to roll it out and it was going to be kindergarten to grade 12 and and students were going to learn so many skills every year. Well, when COVID hit and we had to go to online learning and everybody had to develop a Google platform for the uh, teachers and a a Google classroom. They had to post their work in there. Kids had to access it. The parents had to help their children get on and listen to lessons and do the homework at home. Things that we had that were going to be on this continuum for 14 years (laughs) happened in about two years. And it was an amazing example that when you put people, you know, um, there's that nice saying, you should discomfort the comforted and make, well, what's that? What is there a saying like that about comforting the discomforted and making the comfort people in a comfortable position um, into a position of discomfort so that they learn yeah. a lot more. And, and I actually yeah, saw that firsthand as many of us did in COVID. So I think, you know, there's something to be said for that. Again, I don't do it too often. It's, a, it's mm-hmm. pacing it over time, but it's um, good leadership. I think to do well, that. yeah. When we talk about when we when we use the phrase "stepping out of our comfort zone," I don't think we mean that to be all the time in every in every situation. That, that's <laughs> no. not realistic because we do have our passions and our interests and our expertise that we we ought to be able to lean into our strengths, if you will. But so that there, that's I think a really interesting balance as a leader is how do how do we do exactly what you said, giving people the right amount of like you need to be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. That's not the worst thing in the world. I don't want you to feel that way all the time with everything. Right. But for this little bit, like it's, it's a good thing. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. And give people space to, to, 
you know, learn, make mistakes. Like, yeah, like, and, and yeah. So if you can create that kind of environment, I mean, again, that's perfect, perfect environment for learning, for schools, for classrooms to feel that way. Right. You don't want kids just to be locked into, you know, they like, they like doing, you know, like when we talk about voice and choice is like, well, you know, if, if I asked my, my grandkids what they want for dinner, if, if they wanted their voice, it would be, you know, a candy and, and whatever ice cream, right? They're never going to try bro- broccoli. So sometimes you got to say, you know what, you got to try the stuff you're not really comfortable with. That's how you learn. Yeah, it's a good example. Well, I, I'm excited because I also want us to model what we're saying is important for other people. So if it is really important for us to trial things, to muck mm-hmm. around with something, to to be innovative, to pilot something, and be okay to make a mistake and then say, "Oh, that didn't work so well. Let's do it. A, let's do it a different way," then we have to be very comfortable to do that ourselves. So that's right. You know, I, I like to put people into positions where they can muck about and see what else, what they can be, what they can create. Oh, fabulous. And so uh, just to thank you for sharing all that stuff. And, and before I let you go, uh, my three little rapid, they're not even rapid fire questions. I sometimes call them fun questions. I don't know if they're fun or not, but they're three questions <laughs> I ask everybody. Number one, what are you reading and listening to? So I don't know if you're still sort of honed in on, on, you know, uh, Dr. Lisa Waltz, director, executive coach, or do you have some other stuff that you're reading and listening to that maybe isn't exactly in line with your professional life? Whatever you tell me. Well, I, I actually joined a book club this year, which is fun. So I'm reading, um, oh, and now I'm going to forget her name, but I just read Demon Copper Head this summer, which is a book about the opioid ad- addiction. And yes. uh, the lady who wrote it wrote the Poisonwood Bible, and it's a fabulous read. It was a bit heavy for the summer, so I wouldn't mm-hmm. recommend it then. But and on a professional note, I'm reading The Listening Leader, which is a new book by Shane Safir, who which we're okay. studying in our board. Yeah. And it's um it's a culmination of great leadership works and literature, and um it's just reminding us that we've learned a lot already. You know, that we need to just bring back sometimes, not always about the new, new, new. It's about mm-hmm. remembering that there's a lot of things that worked well and that we've gotten away from and can, reconsidering those ideas. Fantastic. What are you what are you watching? Are you watching any kind of fun streaming show or did you watch over this summer any any mm-hmm. binging you did? Yes. Uh, <laughs> what, what have I been watching? Jeepers. You know what? Black Mirror. My husband and I have been going through the new Black Mirror se- season, oh. which is some of them are kind of dark, but it is it's intense. Very... Me, but you know I, what? I couldn't get through. I got through about three episodes, and I thought, like, okay, I, I'm, but maybe, maybe I should pick and choose them or something because I, I was like, whoa, this is heavy stuff. You know fascinating, what I love about though. It? it is fascinating, and it's so creative, and and things that you know you might yeah. have contemplated or thought about at one point in time, but they actually put together in a whole series. Pretty, yeah, pretty good. Well, yeah. And I, I, I probably need to revisit that and, and come in, come into it with the right mindset. Cause I, I think, yeah, I was, I, I think I was thinking of it was going to be more of a, just a revealing of technology kind of stuff. And then that's part of it, but, but I think you're, you're probably onto something better. So that, that's a good one for me to write down <laughs> now. I have to admit, I I am not super geographically literate around that sort of southwestern side of Ontario. So, I mean, I Toronto, that all area, Metro Metro Toronto, GTA, good on that. Um, even north, I'm okay a little bit. But where you guys are is a little different. So tell me a little bit about what are some places, if I were to come drive that way, head, head west of Toronto and Kitchener, what would mm-hmm. what should I check out in your area that's like, oh, you need to do this when you're there? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that question because I, I was a, in York Region for 25 years and I didn't uh, really know Southwestern Ontario until I moved here to take on this job. And we settled in Stratford, Ontario. And of course, many people would know that Stratford is the home right. of the Stratford Festival. So it also has a rival music festival, which is amazing in the summer. And there's all kinds of concerts and things to do there. But as you drive around our region, um, so you can drive north to Listowel, which is a beautiful community, a big farming community. 
uh, great produce, great um, fresh baked goods, all that sort of thing. And, and there's a large Mennonite population there who are very welcoming. We have a lot of Mennonite students in our schools and it's exciting to see um, a new culture, a different culture there. And we have a lot of new um, new immigrants moving to that area. So we're getting a lot more diversity into our area, which is lovely. And then if you travel further west, you will arrive at the shores of Lake Huron and home of Godridge, Ontario is, is there. And, and Godridge has a oh, very interesting um, ge geography, first of all. It's one of the prettiest little towns in Ontario. And it's built around a, a, a um, spoke and hub kind of uh, town. So it's circular with the streets and the city halls in the middle. It's, it's cool. a beautiful town. There's wonderful beaches there, great restaurants all along the shore. Um, the There's a big salt plant there, which is very interesting to see. And uh, the Godridge Jail, which is a, a site to visit. They, they have um, actors portraying what it was like uh, many years ago. And then if you drive down the shore, um, down, down the coast of Lake Huron, you arrive at Bayfield and then down to Grand Bend. And all of those are there's a many, many beautiful little towns in our uh, community to visit. It's, it's actually quite a tourist area. Who knew that this is actually becoming wine country? There's a lot of um, wineries popping up and, and small breweries and tons of great restaurants and tons of theater in this area. So if you're hmm. um, artistic and you love, you know, love local theater, you could go to something different almost every night of the week in our in our area. Wow. Uh, do you know who, do you know what famous athlete is from Listowel? Yes, I do. Corey, what's his last name? Connors. Very good. Very Corey good. I, I mean, I, cause I'm a, I follow golf. So I see that, I see that name all, but I actually had no idea where in Ontario it was. So now I do. Thank you very much. And also listen, Lisa, I know you're retiring, but if, if the executive coaching stuff doesn't work out, why don't you just be a tourism, uh, <laughs> from Avon Maitland. Work for them. You do really, really well. I might get people <laughs> lost, but it is a beautiful area. And you know what? Well, I'm so you sold it. it. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely <laughs> sold it. So you're not planning to move from the area then, are you? No. We made Stratford okay. our home and we have no intentions to move back because we Lovely. like it that much. Yeah. Lovely. Well, this was, this was fantastic, Lisa. I'm so glad you we took the time to do this and connect and I, I, I got this chance to share with you before you, not, you're not exiting into any sunset. You're just going on to a new chapter. So like, I, I want to be clear yes. about that. Oh, I know that. So, thanks, well, thank you well, for all you've done for the, for the school districts and, and Ontario education in general. Oh, thank you. It's been such a great journey. I loved every moment of it. And I'll just look to see what comes next after this. Absolutely. It's, well, it's different, good, you know, I'm at sure. this stage because you, you don't plan out your next steps. Whereas every other part in your life, you, you know, I've made a strategic yeah. move. And so this is That's quite right. interesting to, um, to have a little more flexibility to think beyond those, uh, <laughs> beyond the lines. What else That's might right. be possible? Well, I'm I hope sure you'll this do was, well. was what you wanted. This was great. Thank great you. This was awesome. You. Yeah. Uh -huh.